I, I got interested. Back then it wasn't called behavior, it was called uh, the education department. And, um, and I actually created the very first um, humane uh, behavior department at San Francisco SBCA. And now of course every humane organization deals with behavior because mm -hmm. that's why the dogs are there. You know, they're not there because they are a doodle. They're there because they bark and pee indoors and pull on leash and, and all that. And so, um, and then along the way, Kelly and I, um, my former wife, we, we developed Open Paw, which was a shelter behavior program. And we developed it um, at the same time in tandem with the shelter medical program. Okay. Um, that um, Sheila Sergerson developed at Davis. And so, you know, we played off each other. So because a lot of behavior restrictions, they say, oh, you can't do this, they're puppies, they've got to be in quarantine, you know, and all that stuff. And so we realized, no, we don't have many physical constraints on what we want to do. And that just having a dog in the cage that's seeing no one is the very worst thing you could do for it. You know, it's not a shelter then, it's like a prison, you know. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a combination between a country club and a university. <laughs> and, by, and the whole point of doing that is uh, obviously people say to train up animals and make them more adoptable by teaching them to sit on cue, to walk on leash, to go pee and poop on cue and shush and all that stuff. But no, it's actually to educate the volunteer base so our volunteer base was about 500 who then went, wow, I wonder if this works with my dog at home. Uh-huh. And your neighbor's dog. And to, by that way, educate the community. So now fewer dogs are coming in. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like that is something that does definitely get overlooked when people think about problems in their animals, the enrichment side of it. Sometimes it's just a lot of pent up frustration that they do need to get out. So that's great that you actually got people to start thinking about that aspect, especially in shelters. Well, you, you also have to focus on uh, pent up, you know, excitement. And uh, part of training is teaching a dog. Like yesterday at my birthday party, we had 20 dogs come and a lot of them hadn't seen each other since they'd been in the in training in the facility and then they saw a best friend dog and they wanted to pull towards it mm -hmm. but the handlers were like steady and you could see these dogs they could barely constrain themselves they would jump forward back pedal jump forward back pedal that you know they never tightened the leash but they just wanted to rush up to their friend and jump on them and lick them and chase them and that and so coming up with a ways that a dog can um, just uh, totally go crazy is really important. And I developed this very simple exercise that works beautifully with dogs and with children. And we call it jazz up, settle down. So you basically put craziness on cue, or I call it silly time with children. And I say, <laughs> right, let's be silly. And they can be as silly as they like until I say, right, normal child. And they have to stand still like that. Well, with dogs, we do jazz up. You've got to leave the ground. You've got to vocalize. Then I go down. And in a group, I, I've done it in a group of 100 dogs. Mm -hmm. And I'm counting the seconds before all 100 dogs can change from crazy dog to lying down, looking at their owners. And I say, we're going to do this till all dogs here can settle down in less than three seconds. Now they've got it. Now you can, you know, I would often in my car, you know, driving to the San Francisco SPCA, Omaha had been in the office all day long and he really mm -hmm. wanted to do something. So in the back of the car, I'd say, hey, Omaha, silly time. And he would, <laughs> and then I'd say, okay, chill. And it was like, that was it. He'd got it out of his system. Then he would lie down again. And I think it's such a shame that so much training takes the dogginess out of the dog. You will never pull, you will never bark in this town again. I mean, come <laughs> on, you can have a lot of fun with dogs that bark on cue. You know, I'd go <laughs> on the radio shows and I'd take Omaha and I'd say to the host, you know, he answers questions too, because no one can see him there when you're on radio. <laughs> so, you know, the host would be like silly and say, okay, Omaha, what do you think of the present political situation? Then I would go, the signal for him to go, ooh, 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 ooh. And the host was hilarious, you know? Or so, you go crazy in the living room on a rainy day. 
you know, they've got to get it out of their system. Yeah. And I mean, I have a toddler at home, so that might be something I start using with her. That could be an interesting trick. You know, um, but I was actually like, curious. Right, you mentioned that you went to... You want to do it. You say, <laughs> you need some silly time, and then you can eat in peace. And if they get silly or have a tantrum in the restaurant, you say, oh, this is not a tantrum zone. We have to go out for that. It's really easy to, to deal with that sheer level of activity and noise, you know, even with children. I interrupt you again, sorry. I'll it's fine. Um, I was actually just wondering, so you mentioned that you went to veterinary school. What made you decide that you wanted to go the behavior route? Um, I think it was uh, my second year when I realized if I became a veterinarian, I would be stuck in one spot for the rest of my life. I mean, you have a clinic, it's very difficult to leave it. And I was really sort of peripatetic. I mean, I'd traveled all over the world, north, south, east, and west of Africa, you know, before I was 17. So I thought, well, I better do research. And then I just thought about it, what do I like? And I thought, well, I like obstetrics and I love behavior. I discovered, I took a year off from veterinary studies to do a special honors BSc in uh, physiology and biochemistry of, um, set of reproduction. Wow. So, and I, I discovered an article by Michael Fox about socialization in, in puppies. So mm -hmm. I put the two together, I thought I want to study sexual behavior of dogs. Where can I research this? Well, the only study in progress was San Francisco. So I moved from London to San Francisco in the early 70s and, and loved it. And very shortly, uh, first year, I think, a, um, the director of the university extension had approached some local vets about whether someone could teach a 10 week course on dog behavior. And they all said, yeah, there's this English vet who's researching dog behavior. So she contacted me and I, I gave this lecture and I loved it. I mean, I was teaching at university at the time and like, if a hand went out for a question, it would be like, is this on the midterm or something like that, you know? But when I was talking to dog owners, they were so interested in what I had to say, I just got hooked on it. So I thought, I'm gonna continue researching for about a decade. Then I'm gonna get into the um, dog ownership side of things. Okay. and deal with dog professions, you know, veterinarians, pet stores, shelters, trainers. And um, I just went in that direction. I just found it amazingly fulfilling seeing an owner pull their hair out with a 10 week old puppy. And in one visit, now it was calm, attentive. Mm -hmm. and one by one, the problems were just melting and, and disappearing. And that's honestly one of the sweetest moments, especially when we hold our own like puppy social classes, it's a great feeling to see someone who takes on a puppy, not realizing how much work they can sometimes be because yeah. <laughs> everyone wants a puppy. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of getting that aha moment, like I can do this. So it's, it's great. It really is. I mean, they think that a, a dog's behavior is all about breeding. It's, mm -hmm. It comes from genetic heredity and they, they forget the amazing effect of social heredity. But even yeah. within a breed, a bull terrier grows up with a bull terrier mum and bull terrier puppies. So they learn to put up a shut up. But in golden retriever land, it's like they're smoking dope and chilling all the time. And hey, let's wag the tail today, dude, you know. <laughs> so social feedback and of course the number one aspect of the social environment is the person. And most people just don't realize you have to train your puppy, no matter what the breed. And so they, they make mistakes, so many mistakes within the first two weeks. And, um, but the joy of me, because I, you know, I started a puppy school in Berkeley. It was the, the world's very first off-leash puppy socialization and training class. And it was in the city where I lived. Mm -hmm. And so in the, you know, ensuing 20, 30 years, I would meet owners who were now on their fourth puppy with me. And, you know, some of them were problem puppies and I would see the dog now white whiskers and beautifully calm <laughs> and behaved. And it, it was really wonderful. That is so great. And my understanding is that you also helped create some of the guidelines for becoming an accredited trainer. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I, I started 
um, the, the way changing train, when I, when I started serious puppy training, it was so revolutionary. You know, before then you had to wait till the dog was one or two years old and was all on leash obedience drills and nothing about behavioral temperament problems. So I offered a completely new syllabus that was taught off leash for puppies and every aspect of behavior, temperament and, and, and training. And when I went on the lecture trail and people would see me uh, conduct a puppy training workshop with mm -hmm. puppies off leash, I mean, they didn't believe it when I talked about it. They just said, I don't believe that. When they saw the workshops, they thought, I want to do this. And so around the country in every city, we had one trainer who was doing it my way. And they thought, you know, it was only them. And all other classes were adult on leash classes. And so I thought, I'm going to get these people all together. So I started an association called the Association of Pet Dog Trainers, which is now the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. Mm -hmm. All these people together, there were 307 of them at the seven day conference I put on in Orlando. I called it the seven day doggy extravaganza. <laughs> and when I saw them meet each other, and realized they were all doing the same thing. It was really exciting. And so I didn't really establish guidelines. It was just uh, got a bunch of people together. And then I, I quickly backed away because I didn't want to stamp the organization with me, like my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. So I, I set it up, you know, government governance by a board of directors. And I mean, it's, it's still to this day, the largest dog training organization in the world. And there's many similar organizations I also help set up in Canada, Japan, Australia, France, you know, and it really is the, the quickest way. You know, I, I don't talk, it's un, unusual since you are a humane society. I don't even talk about what's humane until mm -hmm. the last resort. I say, look, this way is quicker and easier, your choice. If you want to do it on leash with an adult dog, well, and I give them a quote in terms of how many consultations they need, mm -hmm. and how many dollars it will cost. So I say it'll be about ten thousand dollars, you know, half payment up front. Um, but a puppy class, two hundred dollars, man, you're going to accomplish so much. And if you want to go on, you can to another class. But it was just quick, easy, and because it was scientifically sound, effective. Yeah, and if you really think about it in the terms of actually how we end up learning, starting that foundation early, even for people, is really critical because that's how we build a foundation for continued learning. So it's the exact same thing yeah, in dogs. Absolutely. You know, it's teaching children to want to read, not forcing them to read. And I, mm -hmm. I feel the same about puppies as I do about trainers. I don't want to say to a trainer, what you're doing is inhumane. Well, yeah. how can they learn from me now? I have just, you know, taken away from myself the ability to influence the, the life of 2,000 dogs, the number of clients that this trainer has each year, just by mm -hmm. insulting the trainer with my holier than now attitude. So instead I just say, well, show me what you do. And I say, okay, give me the dog. I think I got a quicker way. And I always measure reliability. So I say, I know I have a more effective way. If you want a reliable dog for competition, you're going to get there much quicker doing it my way. And so a lot of people came on board very, very quickly, especially in the dog competition worlds. So I actually have kind of a little of a random question, but I was wondering, since you did start early in your education, wanting to go the animal route, was there ever a time where you were thinking of doing something outside of it, um, where you didn't want to be a trainer or a vet? Yeah, when I was at vet college, I um, thought I wanted to study psychology. So I did without leaving the vet college. I, I started a bit of behavior when I did that special one year degree, but also I wanted to be a trial lawyer because I like debating logic with people, which is very useful when you're a dog trainer because it is it's nothing much to do with the, the puppies are easy. Come on, let's be real about this. It's not rocket science, but convincing the owner to do it your way and motivating them to want to do it your way, that requires a lot of psychology and a lot of presenting your side of the argument, if you like, without raising your voice or disagreeing with them. So whatever they say, no matter how silly or inhumane I think it is, 
I say, yeah, I nod my head and say, oh yeah, that used to be a very popular way of doing it 50 years ago, but we just do it much quicker and easier now. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like your, your background and being able to take that course in psychology and even that ties into your behavior, the psychology of animals. So it's great that you were able to find a middle ground to kind of go ahead and meld the two studies. It all, um, came, it all came together. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> cool. And actually my, my PhD in dog behavior was in the psychology department too. So I was always surrounded by cognitive psychologists, operant psychologists, and had a lot of input there. If we just take those two examples, operant psychology is changing the frequency of behaviors classic mm -hmm. conditioning, putting behaviors on cue. But then the cognitive aspect is the dog has needs and feelings too. And we must cater to that or else the dog will not be on your team in the training arena. It will be your combatant and, and doing it his way. And then you have a big problem that relationship just falls apart. It becomes adversarial. Yeah. And I mean, if especially when it comes to training, trust is a very big thing. Your dog has Huge. to trust you. Huge, yeah. And so we have trust building and confidence building exercises. Let's say you're a single woman, you've got a dog and you get a new boyfriend and the dog hates him. What do we do? Well, I talk to the guy uh, privately and I say, look, do this. The dog will love you in two days to the point your girlfriend will be so pissed off that the dog loves you more than her, that that will be the problem. <laughs> And it's so easy to do. You know, we track come here, sit, for example. Come mm -hmm. here, sit, treat. Come here, sit, treat. Come here, sit, treat. 10 repetitions and the dog's lying down next to you. So we do have to accelerate the building of trust, especially in, in breeds where it's usually slow to build. Like, like say, shepherd dogs. They mm -hmm. are really the high fidelity one person dogs, but we want them to trust everybody because a child may run up and hug them and kiss them. We don't want the dog to go, <gasps> skip. Yeah. It's a disaster. So we have an awful lot of, I guess, you know, when Sirius started, what made it instantly famous was we had what I call temperament training. You see the notion at the time, 40, 45 years ago, was that temperament is set in stone and it's caused by genetic heredity. And I showed that you can change a dog's temperament or personality overnight. You can mold the temperament to suit you. So owners made a bad choice. Well, I can't turn that back. They got a puppy now, but I can chill their border collie for them, mm -hmm. teach it to settle down more. Mm -hmm. So we then mold yet another dog. Oh, they got a newfie, but he's not a very active playing dog. Well, I can train him to play activity games. You'll mm -hmm. have a shorter duration, you know, than say a Border Collie or a Weimarana. But so it's all about molding temperament. And a massive part of temperament is trusting people who are actually the most difficult species of all to trust because people can be pretty weird and nasty at times. Well, that isn't the truth. Yeah. Um, so I guess a follow-up question to that would be, there are a lot of times that even in our shelter environment, we get questions about temperament and how to start approaching training. Are there any books that you would recommend or even resources that you recommend to people? Oh yeah, I, I would go, I mean, the Bible would be openpaw.org. That's open, like an open hand, but mm -hmm. open poor, O-P-E-N-P-A-W.org. There's a whole manual there, there's videos. And this was what Kelly and I created. Um, mm -hmm. And, and what I love about the open for um, way of teaching people to train dogs, it's a four step process and it enables you to take in a volunteer and they could be a five year old child or a 90 year old man. And after a 20 minute orientation, get them out there training the dogs that day, totally safely but changing the whole environment of the kennel within two days. So right. it's an open paw program within about two days, all the dogs are house trained. They will only uh -huh. urinate and defecate in their dog toilet, which is usually donated by the fire department, you know, with a nice big, you know, fire hydrant. And they will all, if they see a person approach their cage, mm -hmm. sit down and shush. 
It's uncanny. Oh. You're now in a Barclays facility and it's all these volunteers that have done this on 20 minutes training mm -hmm. by teaching them two of the easiest training techniques of all, classical conditioning mm -hmm. and all and none reward training or, or wait and watch. So they do nothing. They, yeah. Like classical conditioning, they just walk by the kennel and, and toss in a treat. We do it with all dogs, even if say they are heaven forbid waiting for euthanasia because there'll come a day when a person has to go in that kennel and walk the dog to the room and hold it. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want the dog to scream or struggle at that point. Mm -hmm. So at least the dog will trust this person and cuddle next to them and, and that will be its last memory. Yeah. yeah so um, classical conditioning for all dogs and then all dogs are taught that approaching human is the cue to sit and shush. Mm -hmm. And we even teach them to act cute on cue. So sit, <laughs> shush, and go, hello. Because that's the quickest way out of the kennel. Think about yeah. it. Yep. That's how people adopt dogs. They don't adopt them on, you know, longevity from medical standards or, you know, how quickly they learn. It's the same way that they choose their life companion, human, you know, coat color, confirmation, and cuteness. Yeah. Think That's usually a, a really yeah. big reason in the shelter. <laughs> Wait, tell me the moment you met your husband. When was that? Uh, I was in middle school, actually. Well, yeah. Yeah. So uh, obviously we were adorable. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> you didn't know whether you're jerk or stupid or silly or serious <laughs> or what, you know? And uh, it was because he was adorable you engaged and got to know each other. And that's the way it is. That's definitely true. And even in the shelter environment, we've had people who come in, they see that adorable Pomeranian and they just have to have it. And then we tell them the behavior that we see. He's a little barky. He doesn't like certain people, but hey, he's adorable. Um, and yeah, those are the dogs that usually go the, flat, uh, the fastest. Really quick though, for our volunteers that are watching, the implemented program that Dr. Dunbar is talking about is the same as our Bark Patrol. We basically have volunteers just wait till the animals calm down and then they get rewarded for that behavior. That's Good. sit and shush. Yep. So exactly. thanks, volunteers. Yes. wait and watch, wait, watch and reward. Yep. You know. Uh, let's see. So for people who want to get into training or who want to start studying animal psychology and behavior, what would be your recommendation for them to get started? Well, my recommendation would be get started right now that if you took the route that I took, it's going to be 10, 15 years before you're qualified to do anything. Now, certainly I've gone a long way in my career because I am Dr. Dunbar. I'm actually Dr. 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 Dunbar. And yeah. being a veterinarian it gives you a certain amount of respect, but that doesn't mean to say that I can train a dog. Mm -hmm. A lot of veterinarians couldn't house train a cat or couldn't teach a dog to shush on cue. So I would go to the simplest sources, since they are your group, I would say, well, you know, purchase, uh, see if you can make a deal with openpaw.org to purchase a um, one um, access to the manual and the video, and then all your volunteers can watch it. And I'm sure if they didn't say yes, I could get them to say yes very quickly. <laughs> So they're trained up with the four-step open pore manual. I would then definitely read the two books before you get your puppy, after you get your puppy, which I wrote and have been available for free for oh, 15 years now. Wow, uh, okay. We used to give them away as paper books to every vet clinic and every humane society in the Bay Area. Um, and um, it just, and I would deliver them, but it took too much time. And so we started shipping Shipping costs 10 times more than the price of the book. So now they're all online to download. They're very simple and they are really nitty gritty. And I would learn those books by heart. And then I don't care how old you are. I had uh, a next door neighbor, remember I said, who came to a birthday mm -hmm. party. Um, when we met her, she was, she was 12. And we had her doing puppy sitting stuff for us. Like we're late getting home, take the dogs out to pee. The, the, she then started taking on clients when she was 14. Wow, okay. And she made money to buy a car. Yeah. Her, okay. 
it's, you know, wonderful. Number one, I think children are quicker learners because mm -hmm. they're used to learning. You see, if you are a veterinarian, you've got so much proactive inhibition. You've learned mm -hmm. the old way to do things, which is so out of date now. Well, that inhibits you from learning something new, whether mm -hmm. it works or not. But children are willing to try everything and they quickly, because these days they have less patience, I think, and uh, they, they want it to work now. And that's my view about training. If I can't show you in 30 seconds that I've changed your dog's behavior, then I'm not doing my job. So once they've learned how to raise a puppy, say the first four weeks, they now offer Zoom puppy kindergarten in the home, or they will go in the home because they'll have to go with a parent Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why a 12 year old can't give advice about puppy raising to a family. And um, so I would say start doing that now and you'll be a little scared. The first puppy, the second puppy, the third. I'll tell you what, when you've done six puppies, you'll be getting so much adoration from the families. You'll think you're an expert. Oh, definitely. Um... I did adoptions for a good while before I moved into humane education. And I don't know how I became the, the animal person for my family. Just every, like my dog's peeing, how can I work on that? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it does come through just diving in and working with animal behaviors. Um, would you recommend people start working on things if they already have pets that have set behavior? Oh, yeah. At home. Yeah, I mean, if, if they have pet has a problem, let's, let's just start from the beginning uh, with this dog and he's at home. So again, the everything I've written in those two books applies to dogs of any age, you know, aggression excluded, of course, if the dog's biting, then that would be totally different. But in terms of teaching basic manners, it's all the same. It's just easier with the puppy. Why, you know, as Kelly always says, good habits are just as hard to break as bad habits. So teach your puppy good habits from the outset. And, and that is the mantra of Open Paw. And um, by teaching the families with puppies, you know, it's, it's not dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, advice is golden at that time. And they will soon become renowned in their community because they are 13 years old and doing this. And, um, you know, I mean, a case in point about that, if you look at now behavior in the veterinary profession, mm -hmm. so I kind of bump started it in England. Um, it was a group called the um, Society of Veterinary Ethology. When I came to the States, there were 12 members living stateside. So I said, let's start our own group. So it became the American Society of Veterinary Ethology. It's now the American Society of Veterinary Animal Behavior. And um, if I look at the members in that now, and now, now we have the College of Behaviour in Veterinary Science. When I look at the practitioners, I find them, how shall I put it, much more in touch and useful if they also teach puppy classes, as opposed to if their learning is purely academic and they're using a lot of long technical words. If they've taught a puppy class, they know the nitty gritty of it because you see behavior problems develop. Mm -hmm. And we know how to stop that development, change the direction, get the puppy back on track again. But when you're a so-called behaviorist and you're seeing an adult dog separation anxiety problem, mm -hmm. it'll take you forever to resolve it if you haven't had that experience of tutoring families with puppies. And so not only you see, are you tutoring the puppy and learning that, you're also learning that people won't follow your suggestions and that nearly everything they say is a lie. I'm being serious here. Oh yeah, definitely. And so when you know that, you learn that it's your job to get them to do it. And you have to say things like, I don't want you to feed from a food bowl, so give it to me, I'm taking it home. If you leave the food bowl there, they'll use it. Well, you've just wasted in every meal, 100 food lures and rewards. Mm -hmm. it could totally change that puppy's brain in one day. You know, yeah. so they, they, they just listen to instructions, but don't follow. So another tip to your young trainers, you make the owners do it in front of their eyes. So you say, well, now watch this. You take a bit of food, you have the puppy come and sit, lie down, sit up, stand lie down and stand again. Then you pass the food to mum. 
because she's the best chance of someone doing it in the family. Then she <laughs> passes it to dad, who is so resistant to trying anything. You've got to say, I, I'm not coming back to this house unless you try and show me you can do what I've just showed you. Because mm -hmm. the last thing young people want to do is work with a client where they're not going to follow your instructions. And this puppy that you've bonded with is going to end up in a shelter. And I tell them, I actually do something which I'm sure some of your youngsters wouldn't mind doing, but I will break down crying. If I see non-compliance, the owner is obviously not doing what I suggested last week. Mm -hmm. After the second session, I say, well, let me say goodbye to your puppy then. And I kneel down and I sort of put my arm around the little puppy and I put my head on his and I say, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, bye. You, you, best of luck. So is this one of those other things that you learned in your psychology class, how to oh, yeah. take it? <laughs> I will make, I won't leave until the whole family is sobbing because they say, you know, what's wrong, Dr. Dunbar? I said, you really want to know? It's you what's wrong. This puppy's died to learn and you just won't teach him. And he's now my buddy and I want him to succeed and you're not helping. So I'm not coming back here until you can call me and say, we swear we'll follow your instructions. And then I say, okay, I'll come back. <laughs> it all smiles because I'm I'm just pretending, but yeah. that show of emotion that the puppy is being destroyed, it basically it crucifies them, and then they will be much more amenable to doing it. And of course, we then make fun, say, right, let's have a competition in the family. You're all going to call your dog all at once, and there's a prize for the first person who gets it. So you've got four family members vying for the dog's attention. I say, well done, mum, you win a ribbon. She's so okay. proud. And then we'd take mum out, say, go to the kitchen, mum. Then now we do it again. The little girl wins the second ribbon. Little boy wins the third. The dog won't go to dad till he's the only person left in the room. So then we help out dad and say, look, I want you to win next week. Here's what you do. Come sit treat, come sit treat, come sit treat, come sit treat, come sit treat. Got it. Every time the family goes to bed, do that 50 times. Take the dog out to pee and poop, and then put him asleep. Yeah. And then next visit, you'll win the competition. So. All righty. So I do have one more question for you, Dr. Dunbar. But before that, I want to address our audience. We are officially opening up for our Q&A section of our session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Dunbar, please go ahead and drop that in the chat. And it looks like first up, we have someone asking, what major would you recommend to somebody who wants to enter into this field but is planning on going to college? Ooh, well, I mean, veterinary science is a great one because you study everything, but it's next to impossible getting in. So to get in, you have to have a strategy. You have to know the names of everyone on the selection board, know what their specialty is, read what they've written. And when you go to the interview, you say, or in your thing, I'm really interested in, and you cite their specialty. You've got to win them over. Um, next up, I would say... I would probably go to the APDT and okay. go to one of their conferences and then get a CPDT, get certified by the Certification Council of Professional Dog Trainers and then start training. And you can do that before or at the same time as you do your professional degree. Okay. Uh, for example, a friend of mine, a vet student I met when I was teaching behaviour um, in Guelph, um, she got interested in puppy training, and so I helped her set up her puppy training school. It paid for her to go through vet college. And there you go. College, she sold the business to another friend of mine to move to a different city. And so do it now, do it now, do it now. Then the choices will come to you. But I would certainly go the practical hands-on route rather than the book learning degree route. Because if you, for example, think, well, I want to get a PhD in animal behavior with dogs. Well, where are they researching that? There's not three universities in the world that are doing it. I was so lucky that I joined a 30 year program that, yeah. been, that started at Yale, ended up in Berkeley on dog behavior. Everyone else is studying squirrels or Drosophila flies or, you know, it, it is so difficult to find academic study that is relevant to what you want to do. So if you wanted to get an academic degree, I would say psychology. The, uh, Learn to deal with those clients. 
comparative psychology, but with paying a lot of attention to operant psychology and cognitive psychology. And that gets you well set to deal with the people and then to extrapolate to the dogs. Perfect. All righty. And somebody else is asking, do you know of any programs that somebody can join while being a high school student? Um, well, yeah, as I said, the APDT. I mean, I would I would do that now. We, um, good Lord, when I started that, was it 25 years ago? And there was a little boy there. Uh, he was a dog trainer's son. I think he was seven at the time. He now has a massive dog training school in Austin. Okay. He, he came every year with his mother. And you know, first as a kid, then as an interested kid, and then as now a major player in the professional world of dogs. Um, there's a lot of online line learning stuff, but I, I would keep it really practical, really practical. And beware of classes or courses where the person is just talking like I am now. You want to see video of the person training the dog as they're talking about what they're doing and, or, or what they're going to do. And because I, I know a number of dog trainer specialists who couldn't do that. Because, you know, obviously I know a lot of people in the dog training world. I could name names which would mm -hmm. shock most people at like, And I would say, this person's never had a dog in their life. This person I've never seen working a dog in their life. And you're talking about people who are 50, 60, 70 years old. And there's a lot of people who just talk the talk. No, you want to watch the people who walk the walk. And um, I think a shelter is the best place to learn the skills because the availability of the dogs and there's a vibrant behavior program there, you know, that's an open paw based, that's the place to learn. And then you start small and, and you want to think of the future. You know, how are you gonna make money? Well, I'm lucky I make money at doing exactly what I want to do. My passion is my money but it's not just my business. Mm -hmm. I employ 25 people. I, you know, that the money that I make because of my passion has given 25 other people their passion. And um, the sky's the limit. You know, I decided to keep Sirius small and not to franchise just because I wanted a family business where I knew all the trainers and could keep track of them. And their CE continues but I could have franchised across the world. No one else was doing it. And a lot of people asked me to, and you know, in some ways um, I'm glad I didn't because I love Sirius now. We do have Sirius Zoom, which is international. Um, but in some ways I'm sad because in the last 20 years, I think dog training has got worse again. It's slowed down, it's got more involved and difficult. And a lot of people are reverting back to on leash with metal collars and shock collars. And that's because we strayed away from the lure reward techniques, which are the absolutely the best techniques to learn. Um, so I would learn those, practice those at the Humane Society. I mean, the, the best career decision they made is volunteering in your group. And yeah. And I'm sure, you know, with just a little guidance, you could give them an education better than they can get in any university to work with animals on any level. And well, what I really enjoy is that they would be able to interact with animals with every personality, every kind of problem behavior, because animals, unfortunately, do get abandoned for a number of reasons. So they definitely get a chance at any of those. But um. I do have someone asking kind of a two part question, which is when do we no longer consider a dog a puppy? And does the method for training change at that point? Puppyhood ends at uh, four and a half months, 18 weeks, boom. It okay. is no longer a puppy. And some female dogs can change overnight. They go to bed a puppy and then 18 weeks and one day they wake up a bitch, which is the you know scientific term for a female dog. I just realized I've got some children in the audience probably. Yeah. Um, whereas an adult dog goes through a protracted adolescence, starting at four and a half months, and they don't really stabilize as adults till they're two for small breed dogs or three for large breed dogs. Do the methods change? No. 
you see the beauty of lure reward off-leash methods, they work equally well with puppies, adolescents, adult dogs, or adult dogs with severe fear problems or aggression problems. Because I'm not jerking the dog or pushing it around or bullying it, that dog will come to trust me, at which point I can teach it. Um, but so many people to me say, oh, like I'm just answering a question on a, a Facebook page today about, oh, my puppy of 12. And I thought, oh, 12 weeks, good, months. I thought, this is not. No. <laughs> but you see, they haven't been training it yet. Because, mm -hmm. oh, oh, he's still a puppy. No, he's not a puppy. He's an old adolescent. Mm -hmm. you know, and he was a large dog too. This is craziness. And we strayed away from neonatal handling. First two to three weeks of life is so important for puppies to get them used to unfamiliar people. They can't hear or see, they're blind and deaf, but they can smell, they know you're a stranger and they can feel. Mm -hmm. When you list the 13 most common bite triggers, I call it the 13 most common reasons for getting bitten, um, eight of them have to do with contact. Well, we can desensitize those before the pup is three weeks old, but they don't do it. Breeders don't do it. And if you don't do it, I'll tell you what, brain cells are dying off by the million every day because we didn't need them. Yeah. So we're, we're dealing with adolescent dogs now, which are severely brain retarded. I'm being ser totally serious here. I give you many, well, you can read, you want to read the scientific articles on, on Dunbar Academy. If you go to the free course collection, which is free, look up the course for veterinary behavior and training. And it's all about early brain development, how most puppies that we deal with, most adolescents, they just don't have the brain cells left. And it's harder for them, you know, it, it's, such, it's such a sadness. And, and the same applies to children, you know, it begins the first day they're born. You got to look at them and talk to them in a normal voice, you know, not go, oh, cheeky, cheeky, chupu, poochie. No, you say, hi there, welcome to the world, James. You know, how is it on the outside, eh? You know, that's yeah. how I talk to my girlfriend's grandson, you know, like a normal person. And soon he'll be talking back to me in a normal voice and his vocabulary will become huge. Yeah, long run, children develop their language skills, the same thing that they hear. So if Absolutely. you teach them, like, they have sense, they <laughs> yeah. will speak to well, you. And that can be pretty scary at times. Now, when did you hear that? Oh, at Gigi's house. <laughs> so you have to watch your language around very young children. Yeah. <laughs> so that is it for our time today. But this has uh -oh. been such a great talk. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and teaching us what it means to work in animal behavior. Well, much too short, but you can have me back anytime if they enjoyed it. And I could like to be of any help to your program at all. And when the, I said, when the pandemic ends, that, you know, I'll come up to Pasadena again and, and give my second talk at your Humane Society. I'm all righty, we will hold you to that. Good. So, all right. Thank you so much for this. Um, thank you all for joining us and coming and learning a little bit with me and Dr. Dunbar. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and yeah. thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, Yvette, Nelly. <laughs> Elle, I know you. You're, you're hidden under. I've got to update. I can't get rid of that. Let me move down. Who is that person there? Kristen, thank you all for listening. I really had a lot of, a lot of good times. So thanks a bunch and learn lots and help out a lot of puppies. Do it now. Do it now, guys. Alrighty. Bye, All right. everybody. Bye-bye.